Fantastic. Well, welcome everybody to today's uh, webinar uh, entitled How to Safeguard Your Business. Uh, I'm Alex Solo. I'm the co-founder of Sprint Law. Um, before we get into the detail of today's presentation, just to quickly introduce who we are, we're an online legal team really designed to help startups and small businesses access affordable legal services. Um, for those of you that have worked before, you would be aware of how our, how our model works, but for those that haven't, we provide completely fixed fee legal services. We don't charge by the hour or anything like that. So that means whenever you need uh, a lawyer's assistance, whether it's for drafting a document, um, you know, getting some uh, compliance advice, employment law, um, pretty much any area of uh, small business or startup law, uh, raising investment, we, we provide uh, an upfront quote uh, and keep the price fixed so you know what you're paying for. We have an optional membership, um, about 90% of our customers sign up to it and it's a really great way to work with us on an ongoing basis. Uh, if you need um, uh, more legal work over time, you benefit from discounts, we monitor your legal health, let you know when laws change and have a bunch of tools like e-signatures and AI tools as well. Um, we uh, are a, a team of uh, a bit over 50 staff. Um, we're originally from Australia. We launched in the UK in 2021. Um, we're growing very quickly. We've won tons of industry awards. Uh, one of the uh, fastest growing businesses from um, our region, uh, a bit over 7,000 clients. Uh, and we're also in New Zealand as well. So um, if you're not already work with, working with us, uh, there is no time like the present to sign up. And um, if after this call, uh, you're gripped by uh, an inexplicable urge to get some uh, legal advice um, uh, for er anyone that wants to book in a free consult with one of our team, uh, we'll drop the link in the chat or you can uh, check out this QR code. I'll show it again at the end um, to book in a free call and, and we can chat about any specific legal questions that you may have. So uh, the agenda for today is really to go through all the key areas of law for small businesses and startups just to cover um, the basics in terms of um, what are the things you should be thinking about ensuring your business is covered for. Um, and you know some of these things you may have considered already, some of them uh, you, you may know nothing about. So I'm gonna give a kind of overview to, to each of these sections. Now, as I'm going through, um, if you have specific questions, do feel free to drop them in the chat. We will have some time for questions at the end, but uh, it's, it's also sometimes good to, to get um, questions while we're on the topic. Um, so do feel free to, to drop them in using Zoom's Q&A feature and I'll keep an eye on them as I go through and try and answer. Uh, so um, before we go through uh, these various areas, we'll talk about business structures, industry regulations, contracts, intellectual property, data and privacy and building a team. Uh, I just wanna talk uh, a little bit philosophically about the role of legal help and legal advice uh, in your business uh, because a lot of people um, you know, know uh, that they need a lawyer when you know some someone asks them to get a contract drawn up. Know that they might need a lawyer if someone's suing them, but not are not fully aware of of when lawyers may actually be of use in your business. And obviously, larger organisations have legal teams and and um, you know know how to use lawyers. Uh, but for smaller businesses, given that lawyers have traditionally been very expensive, um, you know we're often underutilised and. Um, and so it is worth uh, understanding, you know, wh when we may become relevant for situations in your business and when you should reach out for help. Um, and uh, I kind of have on this slide um, the two reasons why your business may need to use lawyers. The first is risk management. And this is the principal uh, reason that, you know, our clients are, are reaching out to us. Um, they're doing some sort of deal. They're setting something up. Um, and uh, they want to make sure that they're protected if things go wrong. Uh, and so lawyers are a great tool in terms of helping you draft documents, policies, sign agreements, contracts, registrations, compliance requirements, all these sorts of things. These are tools that we can use to help reduce your risk of something going wrong. Whether that's something going wrong is that you're breaking a law and you know the, the, the regulator is, is uh, coming after you for some purpose or whether it's a relationship breaking down with a client or a supplier. Um, we have tools that we can use uh, to help prevent against these risks or mitigate the facts of these risks. And these are the, the, these kinds of uh, uh, legal documents and other sorts of, um, of tools that we can use. Um, now, of course, um, for most businesses, uh, you have limited budget. Uh, and uh, particularly if you're a smaller organization, you don't wanna be spending all of your money on um, protecting against theoretical risks uh, in your business when your business may be growing and it, it may not be, um, uh, the biggest risk may be that it's not gonna have enough money to continue operating, uh, particularly if you spend it uh, exclusively on lawyers. So I think it is useful um, to prioritize uh, what you 
uh, spend legal advice, spend, spend on for legal advice. And I think this kind of classic risk matrix is a good way to think about it. I mean, if there's things you're doing in your business that you're quite worried about and uh, there's something's likely to go wrong, you definitely want to get legal advice. If there's things you're doing in your business that, you know, the likelihood of risk is pretty low. And even if something went wrong, it wouldn't necessarily have a big impact on your business. Yes, there might be policies or documents you can put in place to prevent, pre- prevent against those risks, but you know, that may not be what you want to spend your, your legal budget on. So um, if you're not sure, you know, our lawyers and our team are pr- pretty much always happy to have free chats with, with any of our clients to help them map where their specific deal or situation fits in this matrix. Uh, but you know, um, if you speak to some lawyers, they'll tell you a long list of all the different documents and policies and procedures you should have in place. Um, but you're not a large organization. So, uh, you know, I think mapping the specific tasks on this matrix is a good way to just think about um, what you should invest your legal budget in. Uh, the second reason, um, which again, large businesses know, but smaller businesses are not that uh, aware of, is that lawyers are actually really great at helping you make good deals. A big way we do this is in helping you draft contracts. And for many of you, you may have used online templates before to draft documents, customer agreements, terms and conditions, those sorts of things. Um, Or maybe you've just done things without contracts before. Um, We'll talk a little more about contracts in this presentation, but um, one of the big um, uh, ways that lawyers really help improve your business, and it's not just about risk management, but also it's about improving your profitability, reducing your costs, is helping you draft tight contracts If you're a service provider, we can help you work out how to limit the scope of your services, make sure you're able to charge more if things go out of the scope. Um, If you're a a goods provider, we can help you uh, limit the lab, sorry, uh, uh, organize a refund or returns policy that's that's clear and, and, uh, you know, ensures that you're not always having to um, refund customers if something goes wrong when you're shipping goods. If you're a software business, again, your cancellation policies, your renewal terms, we see a lot of these documents, we draft a lot of these documents for other businesses. And there may be ideas or ways of structuring your pricing model or your business model that you may not be aware of. If you're doing strategic partnerships with other organizations, again, we're really good at designing commission and incentive arrangements. So um, do also think about lawyers as a way, if you're doing important deals or, di- or you know, you're, you're, you're putting things together with customers that are gonna happen again and again and again, um, we can also be uh, really great in terms of um, helping you actually uh, save or make money. Um, so anyway, that that's the kind of, um, uh, uh, sort of bedrock for thinking about how legal help should fit into the way you operate your business. But let's get into some of the uh, more meaty subject matter. Um, So uh, for those of you uh, who are uh, either already set up or thinking of setting up your business, uh, one of the first decisions you have to make when you are setting up a business uh, is what your business structure is going to be. Um, and uh, for smaller organizations, you're often deciding between setting up as you know either a sole trader or a partnership or actually going ahead and setting up a limited company. Um, the advantage of the sole trader route, if you're an individual or if you have some business partners, the partnership route is that it's, it's quick, it's easy, uh, it's fairly free to register online. Um, and you can, you can go ahead, get a, a unique taxpayer reference number. Um, uh, if you're business exceeds uh, certain thresholds in the first couple of years, you may also want to get um, or need to get uh, VAT registrations, uh, but you get a couple of registrations and uh, you're, you're kind of able to get set up and operating uh, fairly quickly. Um, now, the big challenge with these uh, kind of quick and easy um, uh, ways of structuring your business is you, know, you, you don't have uh, what we as lawyers call a, a limited liability or liability protection. And so most uh, legal professionals uh, would advise you if you're running any kind of serious business to consider setting up a limited company, which we have kind of on the right of the screen. The advantage of a limited company is if something goes wrong in your business, um, the liability uh, of the business is limited to the company, as the name suggests, and it means that the individual assets of the owners of that business uh, you know, are not potentially liable to, um, to you know, end customers or anyone suing your business. So, you know, for example, if you have a, a house or, or an expensive car or an expensive uh, musical instrument um, and, um, you know, you uh, are out there doing a sole trade of business and something goes wrong with a customer and they say, oh, you know, your advice, your service, your goods you provided caused me a significant amount of loss. They can sue your business, and if you're a sole trader or uh, a partnership, with some exceptions, because there is something called a limited partnership, but without getting too complicated, if you're a sole trader or a partnership, your assets, your musical instrument, your home, your house, uh, 
uh, your, your, your car, whatever it is, it's all potentially on the line, even though it had nothing to do with your business. Uh, and that's because when you're running these sole trader partnership models, um, the law doesn't see a difference between you as an individual and your business. You're all one and the same. And the advantage of a limited company, and it was an innovation you know, that was created um, about um, uh, you know, 500 years ago, was this idea that we're going to create these fictional legal people called companies. Um, they are their own person, uh, and they can conduct a business, and they can be liable for, th for things, but they are independent from the owners of the business. And you know, a company has something called shareholders, something called directors. Uh, directors you might think of as you know the, the the mind and the arms of the fictional legal person that's the company it can you know operate its bank accounts it can sign documents on behalf of this fictional legal person and the shareholders are sort of like the body of the company um, they uh, kind of own it control uh, you know control it um, the analogy falls apart a little bit but they can appoint the directors they can you know control what the the mind and the and the and the arms can do so that's kind of um, how a company works and again as I said earlier most um, uh, most uh, lawyers uh, would suggest if you're operating a serious business, uh, you should go ahead and have this limited company model. It, it means that if something goes wrong in the operation of your business, uh, you, know, you as an owner um, you know, will not be liable. Now, if it's just you running the business, you would be both the director and the shareholder. If there's three people, you may make three of them directors, three of them shareholders. Uh, if you have investors in future, you may have more shareholders or owners of the company than you have directors. The directors are controlling the day-to-day -day decisions, signing documents, the shareholders ultimately own it. Um, so there's different ways to allocate those, those responsibilities, uh, but ultimately um, you have this, again, fictional legal person, the, li the limited company. And when you set up the company, um, you know, you'll again have your uh, UTR numbers. Uh, when you hit certain thresholds, you have your VAT registrations. If you employ people, you have pay registrations. Uh, but the, the main thing you're going to get that's different, of course, is a company registration number, which is going to identify your company. So um, hopefully that makes sense in terms of how one might set up a company. And for some of you, that may be um, fairly basic information. Um, now, uh, there are more sophisticated structures that you can use. Uh, and so on this screen, we have three examples of structures that you can use um, uh, in addition to just setting up a single company, and particularly for startup companies or businesses that are getting larger and having multiple business lines, um, this can be a really good idea in terms of how to structure your business. Uh, and what you can do, in, you know, we have on the left sort of what I was just talking about, a single company structure, which may be owned by the founders and potentially have investors as shareholders. Um, now in the single company structure, you have the one company that's the fictional legal person. It, it will employ people. It will enter into contracts with people. It will hold all of the money in your bank account, in your business bank account. It will own your intellectual property. Um, but uh, of course, while the founders and investors are, pro are protected from, uh, in most cases, um, issues that may occur in the company, the company could still get pretty valuable. Like while your house and home may be protected, if the company has um, valuable assets, it starts to generate a lot of cash, you may also want to protect some of that stuff too. So in the middle, we have this model called the, the dual company structure. And it's quite common to actually set up a second company, which you would call an operating company, and also have a holding company. And in this model, you have two fictional legal people. One of them is out there doing risky stuff. It's employing people. It's entering into contracts. Uh, it's potentially suffering from uh, liability issues. Uh, but all of your um, core assets are uh, held in your holding company, which is almost like your safety deposit box of your core IP and maybe uh, a significant cash balance. And again, something goes wrong down here in the operating company level. The liability of that organization is limited to the operating company. And so all of your assets are safe and you know the founders and investors are still extra safe because they're two levels up. So this is a common model we recommend um, and particularly for businesses that are raising investment uh, and they're gonna have significant amounts of cash, uh, we do suggest um, considering the holding company structure. Um, and so for, for example, um, in the case of, of Sprint Law, you know, we began with one entity, um, Sprint Law um, uh, Limited. Uh, but then pretty quickly, uh, as our business started to grow, we split into two entities, Sprint Law Group Limited and then Sprint Law Limited. Um, as we uh, expanded actually internationally, uh, you know, to um, we ended up in three countries, Australia, the UK and New Zealand. We ended up 
with you know three different subsidiaries and we, it was more than a dual company structure and you know so we have sprint law group sprint law australia sprint law uk sprint law new zealand and that means if something goes wrong in our australian business it has no impact on our uk business and if something goes wrong in our uk business it has no impact on our new zealand business and none of them uh, have any impact on our kind of holding company so that's an example of how your business might be be organized um, as as it grows uh, and you don't have to do all of this on day one uh, but it is often, if you think your business is going to expand, um, useful to at least set up the two two levels of the holding company, operating company quite early on because it can be complicated to do it later to split one into two. And uh, once you've gone from one to two, it's a lot easier to go, to add three, four, five, and six because you can just add extra companies on the side. So, um, so that's the dual company structure. Um, we have on the right... Um, uh, uh, what we call a trust structure. It's similar to the dual company structure or multiple company structure, uh, but you can see there's some different stuff happening at the top. This is not super common, um, but sometimes particularly for startup companies, um, but also it can be the case for, for small businesses as well. Uh, it can be beneficial for the owners of the company uh, in their capacity as shareholders to not hold their shares personally as individuals, but to actually set up yet another company called a trust company um, or trustee company. Uh, and that is the company that actually owns their shares in the holding company. Uh, why would you do this? Uh, from a legal perspective, you can see in these images, the founders are protected from you know uh, employees and issues with clients uh, in this model, but they're actually not protected from each other because while the founders aren't de dealing directly with any individual employee or any individual client, they are co-owning this holding company together. And so potentially if there's a fallout between business partners, the founders can sue each other and come after their uh, house, you know, their car, their musical instruments and so on. So adding in individualized trust companies uh, in between each of the founders can provide an, yet another layer of protection. And you can see in this model, uh, founder one is very well protected uh, they've got a little shield of the trust company from founder two, and then they're double shielded from any issues um, sort of uh, further down in the, in, in the business. So um, uh, it can be beneficial. There also can, depending on your personal situation, be certain tax advantages to holding your shares um, in, in, in uh, through a trust, but that really does depend on um, some sort of personal tax advice that you might want to get. But again, in the case of Sprint Law, um, you know, we do have this structure set up. So, you know, this is the kind of... Um, gold standard lawyer version of how you might set up a company. Uh, but of course it can get a little expensive with all the different companies. So I'd say um, most common, we see um, small businesses operating uh, through a single company structure. Uh, we see startups that intend to raise capital operating through a dual or multi uh, company structure. And we see uh, small businesses graduating to medium sized businesses or operating multiple business lines, moving from that single to the multi company structure. So um, depending on your situation, you know, what you have now may be fine, but it's worth being aware of these different models um, or structures um, uh, for the future. Um, so that's uh, the, the, the company structuring piece. Um, I'll move now on to uh, the next topic uh, I want to talk about. So, um, you know, for those of you that um, have um, got your uh, businesses registered and set up, whether it's a company or sole trader or however it is, one of the things we always um, like to remind our clients is to um, uh, ensure they are across the regulations that may apply to their business operation or that may apply in their industry. Uh, and um, this is something lawyers can help you with, but also you can really do this yourself. Uh, and depending on what your business model is, uh, it's very um, probable that there are some kind of regulations that may apply to what you do. Um, if, for example, your business is a B2C business, you um, have individuals rather than businesses as customers, most people would be aware of the Consumer Rights Act 2015. Uh, there are um, many regulations in that act uh, that affect the way you can operate your business. Uh, you know, they require you to have meet certain standards in terms of the goods you provide. They provide they require you to comply with certain refund policies. And they require uh, you to provide certain notices for the types of goods that you may pro be providing. And they specify clauses that you have to put in your contract, or you may be breaching the law. So, um, if you're running a B two C business. Uh, you, you really need to make sure that you're ticking the box because there can be fines and penalties for not complying with this. Um, you know, if, for example, you're in the financial services space, we have a lot of clients that are fintech companies. Um, you know, those businesses, in addition, have the Financial Services and Markets Act to worry about. 
Uh, and again, um, we see a lot of, particularly again for startup companies, um, innovative business models come along where you know the founders think they've come up with a new way of doing something in their industry. Uh, but um, the reason why no one's done it before is often because there's something buried in the regulation that makes it very difficult. So um, whatever industry you're in, whether it's uh, health, uh, whether it's um, uh, you know, um, consumer goods, uh, whether it's um, technology, uh, just be aware if there's a, a, an industry, uh, a piece of regulation or regulator, you should go to their website uh, or have a look at that uh, regulation and just be sure you're across what it says and make sure there's no procedures, processes uh, that you need to be putting in place um, to, to sort of uh, comply with the regulations. So um, I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, it's just something that's often easily missed. Uh, people forget to go check the regulations and um, some some may be aware of it, but if you haven't already, go have a look. And um, again, our team can help you identify any if you're, if you're um, not sure. So uh, now let's talk about contracts. And uh, we have this slide, which is rather dramatically titled, Contracts Are the Lifeblood of Your Business. Um, and uh, I've kind of touched on this already in the first slide, but this is really, I think, an area where pretty much every small business or startup company should spend a lot of their time um, thinking about, and uh, at least time they're spending on legals thinking about, and. Uh, and a lot of their legal budget, um, uh, you know, is should be should be assigned to these kinds of documents. And for us, as a as a uh, you know a legal team that helps uh, a lot of uh, smaller companies, um, you know, more than half of the work that we do uh, is contract drafting work. So it is the thing that everyone's sort of investing in for smaller businesses. And again, if you haven't invested in some of these documents, um, it is worth considering doing so. So I'll, I've got a few different uh, relationship types on screen, and I'll talk a little bit about the contracts. Now, contracts are fundamentally about relationships. So we have on screen your business or your company in the middle represented as a house, and it has different stakeholders that it will engage with. Most businesses will have customers of some sort. Uh, if you're a service provider, it's your clients. If you are an e-commerce site, it's the people that buy goods on your website. If you're a software business, it's the people that are your users, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, most businesses will, will have customers. Um, and uh, one thing that you want to be thinking about, you know, if you're working with customers again and again and again, which you typically will be, uh, what are the legal arrangements you have uh, uh, in connection with them? Do you have a client agreement? Uh, again, if you're a service provider, that's called a service agreement. If you're a e-com provider, that's called your e-commerce T's and C's on your website. If you ship goods, it's sales of goods. If you are a software SaaS vendor, it's your you know, SaaS terms and conditions when people sign up to your software. But all of these things are your key contract with customers. And what you wanna think about in these documents are a few things. Again, I mentioned this earlier, a lot of it's about risk management. What happens when something goes wrong with a customer? What happens if the service you provide is faulty or defective in some way? What happens if the goods that you provide are not up to scratch and someone gets injured or hurt? What happens if your terms and conditions, uh, you know, aren't, um, uh, sorry, if someone's using your software platform and they get, you know, a virus or a piece of malware or they're hacked in some way? There's liabilities and there's risks and these documents can really importantly through what we call liability limitation clauses protect you from uh, business risk if something goes wrong. Typically, you'll say something like, you know, you, the customer, agree by accepting, you know, um, my quote or by moving ahead with my service or my product, uh, my liability to you will be limited to a refund of whatever you've paid or maybe two times a refund. Uh, and, you know, whilst you may sue me, you may not sue me for more than that. And by proceeding with me, you agree. So just having a simple paragraph like that can make a really big difference in protecting you. And again, if you work with 50, 100 customers, maybe 99 of, uh, of the 100, everything is okay. But it's if just one of them, there's a big issue, you're gonna wish you had that contract with all 100 because uh, it could be business ending just because you haven't got them to sign a paragraph like that. So a big part of it is this risk management, this liability protection. But again, uh, if you're a service provider, scope management, what happens when the customer asks for more and more and more and more and you haven't got a contract in place that says, you know, I'm only providing up to this. If you ask for this, it's not included and I reserve the right to charge more for this. What happens if someone's not paying your bill? Can you have late payment fees? What happens if, um, you know, somebody uh, uh, is, um, is uh, wanting to cancel uh, midterm of a subscription? Do you have um, 
clauses around that. All of these different terms, if designed correctly, can help secure your revenue, reduce your costs, and actually be a way of getting a really good deal. So these documents, and I'm spending a bit of time on these, these customer agreements, uh, you should be thinking for your business, do I have one? If I do have one, is it drafted by a lawyer or did I just copy a template of someone? And does it actually protect my business and achieve uh, sort of some of what Alex is saying? Um, and, and again, this is a lot of where we spend um, uh, some of our time. Um, so, um, so that's the customer agreement. Now I should say, you know, for some businesses, if you operate a cafe or a, um, or a restaurant, uh, it's a bit difficult to get everyone to sign a, a contract before they sit down to have dinner. So for some businesses, it is very difficult to, to put in place a customer terms and conditions. Um, I did once go to a Mexican restaurant where um, they made me sign a terms and conditions before I tried their wall of chili. So um, <laughs> to promise that if I had any reaction, they would not be liable. So sometimes you do see it at restaurants, but in general terms, it may not be practical to have lengthy terms and conditions. And depending on your business, maybe you can only do a one pager, maybe you can only have something condensed, but if you can have something, it is better than nothing for all those kinds of reasons that I, I just shared. So that's the customer agreement. Um, up the top, we have the shareholders. Uh, and so um, we talked already uh, a little bit about the different business structures. And um, if you're going with that company structure, uh, the owners of the company, the founders are um, what we call shareholders. Now they may also be directors, but they are shareholders who own a piece of the company. And uh, ultimately um, the shareholders, uh, you know, uh, are doing business together as business partners or potentially investors. And when people are doing business together, things can go wrong. Uh, and again, having contracts in place between different uh, business partners can be absolutely critical in uh, preventing business ending disputes. And again, one of the biggest issues that we see uh, affecting smaller businesses and startups is a fallout between either investors and business partners or business partners with each other not having any kind of proper agreement in place and uh, two things happening as well as that. One, the issue itself could have probably been avoided had there been a contract that specified, you know, what each party's rights were. And two, when there was a dispute, there was no mechanism to resolve it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the parties ended up either litigating or not being able to resolve the difference and the, and the business kind of collapses in the process. So uh, we see this document, the, the shareholders agreement, um, as a really important contract to put in place between business partners. Um, think of it as kind of a business partnership agreement and it's gonna set out a few things. It's gonna set out what happens in the event of a dispute, uh, what decisions can be made by, need to be made by both parties, what can be just decided by one party, uh, what decisions um, require um, uh, you know, both directors and shareholders to sign off, so the people running the day to day as well as a vote of sort of everyone. Um, what happens if one partner wants to leave, but the other one doesn't? What if one partner wants to sell their shares to uh, another person or part of their shares to another person? Can they bring them in without discussing with the other partner first? What happens if one uh, business partner passes away? Uh, all of these different scenarios, uh, these things happen in business. Uh, and um, you know, lawyers uh, have done uh, quite a bit of work in thinking about different options for how to handle these scenarios. Uh, so again, if you don't have anything in place with your business partners or, or investors, putting a contract like this in place can be really important. Again, people feel a lot safer and secure doing business when they have a clear set of rules. Now, when you set up a company, uh, you get something called a uh, articles of association uh, in the UK, and that can either be a document a law firm prepares, or if you don't have one, there's something called the model articles of association that HMRC provides. And this does provide some rules and guidance for how uh, shareholders and uh, directors can engage with each other, but it's pretty light on and it doesn't cover a lot of the issues that I just, just described. It talks more about how uh, meetings should be conducted and these sorts of things rather than what happens in all these different scenarios. So these contracts, these shareholders contracts, shareholders agreements are very common to be put in place on top of the articles. Um, sometimes people will amend their articles uh, and that's another way of doing it. You can have it embedded in, in the articles, but either way you want some kind of discussion and agreement around what's gonna happen in these different scenarios. And that's what that, that shareholders agreement is. So um, hopefully that makes sense. So we've talked a bit about the customer agreement. We've talked about the shareholders. Um, now on the left side of the screen, we have other stakeholders that your business will be dealing with. Now pretty much every business has service providers, uh, people for whom your business is a customer. Maybe it's your website developers. Maybe it's the person that's um, you've got a lease uh, off them. 
Uh, maybe it's um, you know your your accountants. Uh, maybe it's um, someone that uh, you know is critical in providing services onto your customers on your behalf. Um, these people are your service providers. And similarly, you may have suppliers, similar to service providers, these are people that supply you goods. If you're a goods business, maybe they're your wholesalers. Uh, maybe they are uh, people providing you your uh, IT hardware. Uh, maybe they're people that uh, you know you buy your company merchandise off. Um, these, these people are also people for whom you are customers. Uh, now, um, these people may uh, present you with their own terms and conditions. Uh, in the same way, uh, I'm t telling you that you should have uh, agreements with your customers. Uh, if they happen to be clients of Sprint Law or any other law firm, someone's probably said the same thing to them and drafted them their agreements. Now, if you just sign what you're given, which you may have already done and you may do, uh, you know, you may be agreeing to things like what I described earlier, not having any rights against your service provider, only having the rights to a refund. Now, many times um, you're okay with that. Um, you know, maybe it's you're dealing with Microsoft and it's their, you know, they're providing you your Microsoft Office license as well. You're probably not going to be able to complain to Microsoft that you want to change their customer contract. Uh, or maybe it's a, you know, you're going to the store and just buying a few computers and, and that's fine. But if you have suppliers or service providers who are really critical to your business, they're your key suppliers, they're your key service providers, you're really relying on them and you're paying them quite a bit of money, you might want to negotiate those contracts or have those contracts checked. And you might want to change some, some of the wording. You might want to change um, their default wording around liability limitations. You might want to hold them liable for delivering stuff to you late. You might want um, uh, clear, quick refunds if they provide uh, poor quality goods, if they're a supplier. You may want promises around the delivery times. Um, if you don't review and negotiate these contracts and just accept what you're given, um, you know, you're likely to uh, uh, for you, find yourself in these situations where uh, you know you're 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 left high and dry because you're so reliant on these uh, su suppliers or service providers. So um, this is again another another important identification exercise. You know, big businesses will have every single supplier or service provider contract checked. That's what a lot of um, you know lawyers who work in house do. That all they do is you know there'll be thousands of suppliers or service providers. They'll review and negotiate the terms and conditions for the big organization. As a smaller business, that's not practical. You, you can't have every contract reviewed or checked. So what you want to be thinking about, coming back to this risk matrix, is who are the most important suppliers? Who are the most important service providers? What do I want out of them? And how can I get that locked into my contract with them? So have a think about that. Um, again, lawyers like us can check the documents for you. Um, but uh, and, and again, even if you've already signed something, you're paying these people money and uh, they're often very willing to negotiate, uh, particularly if you're paying them a decent amount of money. So, you know, you can always go back to them and say, hey, you know, we've gotten some advice that we should renegotiate the contract, so we want to redo it. And if they say uh, no, then you may leave in the medium term. Uh, so uh, they're quite incentivized uh, to say yes. So um, have a think about that. And that's, that's another area. Um, again, not suggesting you do it for every contract um, that, that you may have, that would probably be too expensive, but for key contracts, it's definitely worth considering. And finally on screen, we have uh, the um, partners. So these are people who maybe they refer you work, you refer them work. Um, and uh, again, it's a good idea to put contracts in place with, with people that you're referring stuff to, uh, particularly if you're gonna have commissions, incentives and so on. A well-drafted referral agreement uh, can not only reduce the risk of something going wrong in a partnership, but also if you get the incentives right, actually really drive a lot of growth or revenue for your business. And again, we as lawyers know, you may think of some basic models, I'll pay you 10% and so on. Uh, as lawyers, we know a lot of different clever ways you can structure partnership agreements with, um, you know, maybe three tiers, bronze, silver, gold. Uh, we can structure the definition of how incentives are paid, uh, help you work out how reporting works and these sorts of things. So, so these contracts uh, can be uh, quite useful to get done properly. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. It gives you a bit of a flavor for the kinds of contracts uh, you might want to think about in your business. Uh, definitely think about your customer contracts, your shareholders agreements, the key service provider and supplier terms. And if you uh, happen to have partnerships, that may be another area uh, to kind of focus on. Now moving on to the next topic, um, let's talk a little bit about intellectual property. So um, intellectual property refers to the intangible pro property, which in this context, your business may own. And this is different, of course, to physical assets like you know computers or um, cars or whatever it is. 
uh, these are intangible assets, but they may be very important nonetheless to uh, your business and uh, your business's um, potentially point of difference, uh, or it's a way of generating value or revenues. Uh, so um, I've got on screen the four most common types of intellectual property that we see emerge in a business context, and I'll go through each of them. The first is the trademark, and the trademark is a uh, uh, a form of registration that you can undertake to protect your business's brand name, your business's logo, uh, its key phrase or catchphrase, and any other such um, similar sort of brand recognition. So the trademark is all about the brand. And to give you an example, in the case of Sprint Law, we have uh, registered a trademark for the word Sprint Law in the UK, as well as this little S shape in our logo. We have a second trademark for that. So. Uh, what that means is, uh, now I should say, when you register a trademark, you register it in a particular country, in a particular industry, or what they call class. So we've registered the word Sprint Law and the S shape in the class for legal services. And what this means is nobody else in the UK can use the word Sprint Law or anything similar to it, Sprint Lawyer, Sprint Legal, uh, Sprint Laws, um, Sprinter Law, uh, nothing like that can be used. Uh, in the legal industry uh, without our permission uh, to promote goods and services. Of course, people can write news articles about us, describe us in a post, but to actually promote a good or service or a product or a business, they cannot use that term or anything similar to it. That is our goodwill and we own it. Uh, and similarly, people can't use something that looks like this S shape in the legal class. Now, that doesn't mean people can't you know, start a cafe called Sprint Lawyer. Uh, that would be a, a terrible name for a cafe. Uh, maybe Sprint Slaw that serves very, very quick coleslaw or something. <laughs> maybe, maybe they could do something like that, but, but you couldn't have uh, that uh, in the legal class. Uh, and that is where our protection sort of lies. And um, I say in the country uh, because you do have to register country by country. So if your business expands uh, across uh, various countries, um, now the EU does have uh, a kind of EU wide registration, which makes it a lot easier if you're operating there. Uh, but if you're going to the US, uh, you're going to um, places in Asia, if you're going to um, uh, Australia or New Zealand, uh, any of these countries, there's separate registrations uh, which you have to get in each country. So um, very important. Again, one of the biggest mistakes we see, um, you know, if I was to name the three biggest mistakes I see small businesses make, one is this customer agreement's missing, second is the shareholders agreement's missing, and the third is the trademark registration. Businesses pick a name, they pick a brand name, they make a website, they invest in all of these um, uh, important branding assets only to find out that they don't actually own the name, somebody else does, and that person will send them a letter, uh, you're infringing my trademark, you must cease and desist, and that can be business ending, particularly if you've spent a lot of money on the, the trademark. So you want to secure it as early as possible in your business. Um, there's a few different ways. Um, we have the IPO here in the UK uh, where you can um, register. Uh, it does take uh, several months to actually get it approved. So it's a good idea to start early um, and you'll get a sense as to whether you're going to get accepted or not. And there's all kinds of rules and regulations. So it's, it's not a given that you're going to get your trademark, particularly if you have a name uh, that is not unique enough. Uh, you know, we couldn't trademark, for example, the word solicitor in the legal industry because that's a term used very generically. Uh, maybe we could uh, register uh, solicitor X or something a little bit different. So you want to be thinking about your, your brand name and whether it's unique enough. But if you can get that trademark, it becomes a really important way of protecting your brand. Uh, so that's what the trademark is. Um, we've, we've then got copyright. And copyright refers to any uh, uh, original works that are recorded in material form. And what that legal definition uh, really is talking about is works that are original. Um, and we're often talking about written works, musical works, uh, visual works, um, dramatic works. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, we're talking about books, novels, we're talking about music, we're talking about films, we're talking about um, you know, theater plays, but in a business context, we're talking, we're thinking about uh, potentially graphic designs that are done for your business. And we're thinking about potentially blog content that you've written that's original as a, as a literary work. And in the case of technology, uh, software code is also potentially considered copyright. Now, provided that you have original works, original writing, original blog posts, original um, uh, graphic designs and original um, software code, 
uh, and uh, it's recorded in material form. It's not just in your head. You've actually put it either on the computer somewhere in digital form or written it down on a piece of paper. The moment that that's created, and this is unlike trademarks, the moment that that work is created, it is owned by the author that created it. And that author has a copyright for a little over 70 years under law. Um, and so um, just to zoom in on that a little bit further, one big difference between copyright and trademarks is that trademarks, you go register them with um, you know, the IPO uh, and you go through this approval process and then you own the brand. Copyright, there's no registration process. It is owned by the author the moment that it's created. Now, what that means in a business context is if your employees are the ones writing the stuff, writing the code, writing the blogs and these sorts of things, the employees actually own them themselves by default when they create them. If you've paid a contractor uh, money, um, by default, they will own them, even if you've paid them money, uh, anything they've done for you, if they've designed your website or they've written some of the code or they've written content for you, they will own it. So it's really important that only way you can transfer copyright to your business, to your fictional legal person, if it's a company, is through contract. And you need to make sure you have contracts with your employees and your contractors and anyone else that creates uh, any of this original work for your business to make sure that it's being correctly transferred over to your organization. Now, for employees, it's fairly straightforward. Most people will have signed an employment contract at some point in their life, or you may have one already for your business. There's typically a paragraph in there called intellectual property, which says, you know, I, the employee, agree by signing this contract, any intellectual property I create in the course of business will now in the past, present or future be hereby and you know, owned by the business. And when they sign that document, they're agreeing, okay, they may create something for a split second, it's theirs, but then under that contract, you know, the intangible property is being transferred to the company. But if you don't have proper employment agreements and well-drafted clauses, it can be a real risk that your employees technically still own the stuff they've created. So you want to make sure your employment contracts have that. But the bigger issue we see is with contractors. People have paid agencies, individual contractors to do work for their business and either they have no contractor agreement or they've not signed any document of any kind with the contractor or the contractor's given them something and they've just signed it without reading it. We often see intellectual property ownership not really discussed properly and then the copyright still being potentially owned by that supplier. So um, it's really important, and again, coming back to these contracts with service providers and suppliers, that you're making sure you're checking particularly contracts where IP is being generated and making sure there's wording in there whether the copyright's being assigned back to your business. Uh, again, that can be done in a contractor agreement. If you're thinking to yourself, oh man, I've signed a lot of contracts and uh, I, I haven't uh, actually got, um, haven't, haven't actually got uh, something like this signed, there is a cleanup document that we often uh, draft for clients called an IP assignment deed. And that can have a retroactive effect. And you can, you know, if you have a good relationship with your supplier, you can say, hey, can you just assign this document to confirm that I do own what you made for me? And it, it can work as a cleanup document. And that's not a bad document to just have as a template for your business in general. And you can get people to sign it whenever you're uh, wanting to make sure you own their IP. But yes, just in general, the key takeaway here is for any copyright work that's important to your business, and I gave you a few common examples, uh, make sure there is something in writing signed and you keep a copy of that to prove that you actually own what that person created. Otherwise, by default, it is theirs. So we've covered trademarks and copyright. Um, moving on to, uh, sorry, one other thing I should say about copyright. Another issue we often see come up with smaller businesses is, um, you know, you're drafting blog posts or website content and people are worried about um, using imagery or copying content from other businesses, competitors, and other sorts of websites. Um, and that, you know, you should be worried about that because when you are copying other people's content or using their imagery, um, again, it's owned by the author who created it. If they're from the moment of creation, even if they haven't registered it, if they're part of a business, it's probably owned by that business. If you then use it, you are infringing their property, you're infringing their intellectual property, and they can potentially sue you for damages. And you hear stories of, you know, people using images without consent. Um, or you know, plagiarizing blog posts, you need to get permission. Um, a workaround that a lot of businesses use for particularly their digital content is to just use stock, stock websites. A lot of the stock websites just are designed to allow you to use the content with, without permission or by paying for the stock license. And there's some free stock websites out there you just are allowed to use them. Um, so you can do that. And I would strongly advise anyone who's not using stock imagery and just finding stuff off Google Images to, to start using stock. Otherwise you're at risk of 
infringing copyright. Um, so yeah, not only do you want to protect your own copyright, you want to make sure you're not inadvertently stealing other people's stuff in your business. So let's move on to NDAs, also called confidentiality agreements. NDA, of course, stands for non-disclosure agreement. Uh, this is an important document that we generally recommend um, pretty much all businesses have a template of. Uh, if you are a Sprintlon member, uh, we have a free template you can just download if you log, log into your portal. Um, and if you're not currently, um, you can actually sign up, I think, as a free member on our website and, and get the NDA. So um, if, you don't, if people don't have one, that's, that's a quick, easy, free thing to do um, with us. But what is this document? Well, some, some uh, lawyers might not be happy that I've put it on the intellectual property slide because it's not really about property, but I think of it in the, in the same lens for businesses. Non-disclosure agreements are basically, as the name suggests, documents that parties will sign under which they agree that if information is shared between the parties, one or both of the parties promises not to tell anyone. And this is on this intellectual property slide because oftentimes in business you'll have great ideas um, of, of whether, whether they're business opportunities or product ideas or startup concepts or, or relationships that you might want to um, leverage for some purpose, you'll have some great ideas. Now, they may not meet the test of copyright because they're not recorded in material form, they're not a literary work or a dramatic work, but they're still original and they're still a great idea. And really, they're just information. And the question is, how do you protect that? You can't register a trademark for it. You can't protect it through copyright. So these NDA documents are really great for that. And anytime you're about to share some sensitive information, potentially valuable information with another party, it's a good idea to consider getting an NDA in place. If they sign that document and then they do something with the information, you can potentially sue them for a breach of NDA. Now, I'm not saying you should go out there and plan to sue anyone that you tell a secret to, but even the act of getting them to sign an NDA uh, puts them under this legal obligation. And um, there's plenty of studies to show that it has a really strong deterrence effect effect in terms of uh, people actually, you know, breaching your trust and confidentiality. So a lot of businesses will just have a simple NDA, one or two page document in place before they meet with a new supplier, a new app developer, web designer, partner, whatever it is, uh, they'll get them to sign the NDA. Investor, if you're a startup as well, and you, you're going to be sharing a, a ton of uh, financial information, they'll get them to sign this NDA and they can be fairly confident, not completely confident, but fairly confident that uh, their information won't be leaked. Um, so that's the NDA. Finally on screen, we have the patents. Um, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, it, uh, this is really uh, for um, businesses that have created or invented some new scientific discovery. Uh, and uh, this uh, gives you the right, if you can get it through the registration process, uh, to exclusively use your invention or license it to other people uh, for a period of time, uh, a little over 20 years um, in the UK. So um, uh, a lot of people uh, ask us if they can patent their uh, you know, software that they've created or some other idea that they've had. Um, and the, the reason I want to talk about patents uh, is, is because uh, I think that comes from a misunderstanding of what these patents are. They're really reserved for scientific discoveries, you know, the COVID vaccine or some other kind of um, immunization or um, uh, if it's if it's in technology, it's a robotic arm or some, if it's a software, it really has to be some completely novel piece of software that no one's created before. Uh, so if you are in that boat, uh, there are specialist patent attorneys um, and they can help you register it and they'll assess uh, the originality of what you've done. They'll check that it's never been done anywhere in the world and that it's a true scientific invention. And then you can get this really powerful uh, patent right, um, uh, but for most uh, small businesses and startups, uh, it's not that relevant. Uh, so if it is relevant fit for you, I do suggest getting individual support, but um, for most of you, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about this category and really be thinking about these other three as the main source of, uh, of how you're going to protect your intellectual property. So let's now move on to data and privacy. Um, and uh, um, this is, of course, uh, an area in the last uh, five to seven years uh, in the UK that's gotten a lot of attention. Uh, the legal requirements have uh, significantly expanded. Um, and uh, we have the, the GDPR. Um, before Brexit, uh, it was a European. Uh, after Brexit, the UK has pretty much uh, recreated the the European law into a domestic UK GDPR law. So uh, these still apply despite Brexit. And um, and they're quite important uh, for pretty much every business. 
So um, if you're uh, operating um, uh, a business in the UK, um, uh, nearly every business needs to comply with the GDPR regulations around data and privacy. Uh, now, the first step is uh, for every business, you should register your organization with the ICO. Um, the, now, there's technically not every business that operates has to register with the ICO. It's only if you're collecting people's personal information uh, and using it um, in, in specified ways. Um, but it's it's so broad in terms of its definition of personal information, you know, includes people's names, um, phone numbers, email addresses. Um, I'm, I'm yet to encounter a business that doesn't uh, collect personal information in a way that might arguably fall under the GDPR. Um, and so we, we generally advise most businesses to just register with the ICO because this is one of the requirements and it will ask you some questions in terms of how you use personal information. It'll charge you uh, a fee, uh, an annual fee, uh, but it's, it's a box tick uh, for uh, GDPR compliance uh, to show that, you know, you're registered as a, as a data collecting organization. Um, or data collecting organization. And so um, if you haven't done that already, I definitely suggest that that you you go ahead and do it and um, make sure that your renewals remain up to date. Um, now, uh, in order to comply with the GDPR, the GDPR is all about informing your users or customers or anyone from whom you collect personal information, what you're doing with it. Um, you know, you, they're gonna be sharing stuff with you, their name, their number, potentially uh, more sensitive information depending on what your business does. And the law wants to make sure that you're appropriately protecting that information and appropriately informing them as to what you're gonna be doing that with that information. And then if they've got requests about that information, you're able to respond to them and comply with them. And there's two big rights out of the GDPR. We've got the, uh, this right called the right to be forgotten, where any uh, uh, individual who has personal information held with your business can say, I want you to wipe all the information that you hold about me. I want to be forgotten by your organization. And they have a similar right called the uh, subject data access request where they can say, um, uh, sorry, data subject access request where they can say, uh, I want you to give me a list of what you're doing with my information as of right now. And you have to share with them a copy of how you're using their personal information. So, um, so, so those are kind of these core rights and helps I think express the principles of the GDPR. And what you have to be uh, cognizant of in your organization is, is your systems and processes set up in a way where you can actually comply with those requests? Uh, because um, for some organizations, you know, they may have no idea where, which system everyone's name and email address is. Maybe some of it's on your emails, maybe some of it's in your CRM, maybe some of it's on your website, uh, maybe some of it's on your desktop. Uh, where is all this information? And it's important to be cognizant of that and, ideally limit the number of places in your organization where you're holding all, all of your customers' personal information and have it ready in a format where you can either delete it if you need to and wipe it or at least provide people with information about it. And th this is quite important for the GDPR compliance. And again, failure to comply with this stuff can result in fines and penalties, particularly if you get reported to the regulator. So that's the kind of ongoing compliance obligations and there's policy documents you can put in place and a whole ton of things, but, but really those are the two kind of key points for compliance um, on your ongoing operations. And there's also documents that you really need to have in place uh, to be compliant with the GDPR. Most people will be familiar with the cookie notices when you visit a website, if it's using any kind of analytics or tracking people's information, which most websites are, you're required to get their consent. And if they don't consent, you're required to turn off that functionality. Uh, so uh, this is very important um, for uh, for pretty much any, every business. And if you've got web, website designers or developers, um, or if you're using something like uh, Shopify or, or Squarespace, they have plugins for this stuff, but you want to make sure you've got your co cookie notice set up. Uh, and again, if you're not uh, providing the cookie notice and using cookies, there can be fines and penalties. And secondly, you need to have a privacy policy. And this is a document that sets out what I said earlier. You know, dear customer, here is what we're doing with the information. We're going to use it to store it in our CRM system. We're going to use it to provide you with the services or goods that you've asked for. We might share it with our email vendors to do some email marketing with you. We might use it for uh, affiliate partner offers. We might use it for X, Y, Z. You've got to make it clear to them what you're doing with the information and how they can contact you to have it removed if they want. That's the point of this privacy policy. Now, if you're doing things that are unexpected, it's not just good enough to bury it in your privacy policy. The GDPR requires that uh, you, are, you use reasonable uh, endeavors to bring this stuff to 
their attention. For example, if you are going to be sharing, someone's engaging you for a particular service, but you're going to be sharing their personal information with a partner, you really need a separate consent, an opt-in consent somewhere which says, you know, you agree to our privacy policy and you acknowledge we might share this with third parties. Uh, and uh, otherwise, if it's just buried within the privacy policy, um, you know, under the GDPR, that may not be considered to uh, be having brought it to their attention for any unexpected uses. And again, we can provide some advice on where and how you might want to integrate that around your, your processes. Uh, but, um, but this is the, the kind of key with these documents and the notices. And finally, we have the data processing agreements. Uh, these are documents or contracts uh, that, that you want to have in place with your suppliers. So uh, again, we've got this nice diagram of different stakeholders. Your customers are going to agree to your privacy and cookie policy. Uh, now, if you are then taking the information and sharing it with service providers, sharing it with suppliers, uh, and you're sending them you know, copies of people's names and emails addresses, um, the customer has to first of all consent to that. And also the law requires that you make sure that these service providers and suppliers agree themselves to treat your customer's information in the way they process it or handle it in accordance with the GDPR. That wording needs to be in an agreement that you have with them. And there's something called a data processing agreement or data processing agreement that you put in place with your service providers and suppliers, which can uh, tick that box from a GDPR perspective. Note that if you've got service providers or suppliers that are offshore, uh, there's even more requirements. You need to have some additional offshore um, provisions in there and you need to make sure that the geographies that they're operating in will respect and allow them to respect the laws of the GDPR because ultimately this law is all about protecting your end customers personal information from being shipped all around the world and used in ways that they never comprehended. So, so th these documents are very common. We'll often draft a privacy policy for clients, we'll help them facilitate setting up a cookie notice and we will, uh, if they have suppliers who are going to be getting access to personal information, make sure either that the contract or a supplier agreement already has a data processing uh, addendum to it, or we'll help draft that addendum. Conscious that we're already at the one hour, uh, if people need to drop off uh, all good, I'll probably go for another five minutes just to round out the presentation and take some questions. Uh, but, um, but yeah, uh, totally understand if people need to uh, drop off. Uh, so uh, let me just continue. Uh, again, just one more slide after this. Um, finally, on the right in this slide, we have uh, data breaches. And this is uh, the circumstances where your organization uh, may, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, fall victim to uh, some sort of cyber threat um, uh, uh, or um, a cyber criminal who hacks into your organization's um, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, systems and steals your customers' personal information. Uh, now, this can be um, uh, obviously uh, pretty stressful, and um, but it does happen, and it happens more and more. And you know, a recent report came out in the UK showing a, a significant increase, even in the last 12 months, in the amount of cybercrime that's occurring in the UK. So, uh, it is something to be cognizant of in your business. Uh, so, um, you know, if you've complied with the GDPR and the way you've collected and used personal information, and um, You've avoided being negligent, and that's not a concept we've talked about, but in general, uh, in terms of the way that you handle people's personal information, uh, you must use reasonable endeavors to keep it secure from threats, including you know, potentially engaging uh, cybersecurity um, uh, suppliers or undergoing regular cyber checks or storing the information in systems that uh, are reasonably secure. Um, if you're doing those sorts of things, um, in general terms, uh, you may not actually be liable to your customers for damage that occurs through your business, uh, but there is an obligation uh, if the data breach poses a high risk to the affected customers that you've got to both tell them and you must also notify the ICO, the regulator, within 72 hours. Now, this is if it's high risk. So, for example, if you've accidentally forwarded an email that you shouldn't have to your personal email address that contains a list of a few of your customers and it gets deleted straight away, um, maybe you've technically um, breached, had a, a data breach because the information has gone somewhere it shouldn't have. But it's pretty unlikely in that scenario, depending on the specific circumstances, that there's going to be any risk of substantial harm to your end customers. So you don't necessarily have to tell the ICO or the customer in, the, in that case. But if there's a substantial uh, breach where somebody's you know, locked up a bunch of customers' data, they're threatening to release it on the dark web, and, and, and it's, it's sort of on the other extreme, um, very likely you've got to tell the affected users and you have to tell the ICO. 
So uh, this is really worth being aware of because there is a time period. And of course, when it happens, you're going to want to get legal advice and so on. But it's just important, I think, for anyone who's operating or running a business to be aware of this 72-hour requirement because you don't want to miss the deadline if this happens. Um, now, I gave you two extreme examples of high risk and low risk. But of course, the question is, in reality, everything is, is, is likely to be a medium risk somewhere in the middle. And you may not know where it sits. The ICO helpfully have a helpline which you can just call. It's available, um, I think, every day. And if you're not sure, you, you can actually just explain what happened. And they're actually quite helpful in telling you whether they think you need to report or not. And it's an anonymous helpline. So um, that's available to, to reduce your stress levels when this occurs. And of course, if you're uh, working with us as lawyers and, and so on, we can provide some advice to you as well in terms of what you have to do. Um, so um, of course, when it happens, you know, you're going to engage professional support uh, to help you. You may want to get cybersecurity insurance if you don't have it already, because if there's IT rectification work or legal fees that flow from the data breach, um, if you've got good cyber insurance, it'll cover all of it. So I, I, I recommend a lot of smaller businesses um, just go out and get a cyber insurance policy and, and just getting the policy the insurer is actually quite good at helping you set up the right security measures and 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 know what to do in the data breach. Um, so even if that's the only thing you do, uh, it can it can make a big difference uh, from doing nothing. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how uh, the data breach stuff works. Um, flicking just to the final slide now, um, and um, I won't spend too much time on this because I know we're we're a little short on time. Um, for those of you who are hiring employees. Um, uh, you want to make sure that you're complying with the workplace regulations in the way that you engage with them. Uh, and um, uh, we have um, sort of three different sorts of actors that you might engage with in your team. Uh, one is uh, the employee. That can be a full-time, part-time, casual employee, fixed-term employee. Uh, these are people who you pay a wage or salary to. Uh, in the UK, there are uh, there's, a, there's an act called the Employment Rights Act 1996, and that has uh, a ton of rules and regulations. We've got national minimum wages. Uh, we have um, rights to statutory sick pay, uh, so on and so forth, holiday pay, and, and other, other sorts of things. Um, in general terms, you just want to make sure you have a, a proper employment contract with your employees to make sure you're complying with the act in the uh, amount that you're paying them, as well as in the rights that you're granting them. Also, that contract's going to cover you for the copyright we mentioned earlier. Uh, and then you want to make sure that you're paying them appropriately um, in terms of uh, managing their uh, national insurance contributions as well as all the tax requirements. But again, often people will engage um, uh, bookkeepers or payroll providers to assist with that aspect. So um, in short, uh, for most smaller businesses, um, for employees, make sure you set the salary right, make sure you get a contract in place and make sure um, you're paying people either using a payroll provider or in, in accordance with all of those other sorts of uh, regulations. Now, contractors are very attractive for smaller businesses because you don't have to bear the burden of promising ongoing employment to uh, your staff. You can use them on either a fixed basis or pay them per use. Um, and it can be very attractive to you know, avoid financial risk associated with hiring a person as well as all the other legal obligations that um, we just kind of described. So um, if you're hiring contractors, the way it works is they're typically required to handle their own tax affairs and uh, you just will pay them under an invoice uh, like any other supplier. You'll have a contractor agreement with them instead of an employment agreement. Again, it's gonna cover that copyright that we mentioned earlier and set out what they're gonna do for you. Um, uh, it's a bit more arm's length um, and um, you know they may not have much liability to you if something goes wrong, uh, but um, that's kind of how that works. Now, we do have uh, a law in the UK called the IR35 um, law, and there's also uh, some laws in the Employment Rights Act 1996, which are effectively designed, both of those two pieces of law, to stop people using contractor arrangements when really that they, they should be employees. If you've got someone working for you full time on a regular basis, kind of like an employee, and you pretend they're a contractor just so you don't have to, you know, handle their tax affairs and comply with all the laws, uh, the law can deem you um, can can make them what's called a deemed employee and say, no, 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 we're going to tear up your contractor arrangement. You've got to handle all these things for them. And again, there's fines and penalties for attempting to do that. So. Um, it is important if you're using contractors and uh, they're not true contractors, you're, you're really treating them like one might, a reasonable person might think is an employee. 
you get a little bit of advice on that and make sure that you're allowed to actually use them as a contractor. It's an area that we often see happen uh, for businesses that are using someone again and again and again. So think about that risk if you have an ongoing contractor relationship, um, but assuming you're not falling foul of that, uh, it's a very legitimate way to engage staff as, is, as a contractor, particularly uh, as a smaller business. And finally, on the right, we have interns, um, often used by small businesses, uh, ideally on an unpaid basis for them uh, to um, you know, get, some, get some assistance. Um, it's worth being aware that there's laws in the UK around unpaid internships in particular, and we get some questions about this. If you wanna take on unpaid interns, it has to be for course credit for a university degree or has to be what they call genuine work experience where you know, they're getting more benefit out of it than you are. They're kind of shadowing you rather than be, having to do tasks. If you're trying to put them to work, it's not for university credit and or it doesn't have to be university, it can be any tertiary institution. It's not for tertiary credit, it's instead uh, so you can get some free labor. You may be in breach of the minimum wage laws and you may actually have to pay that intern. So again, just be careful about using unpaid interns um, if it's not falling into those criteria that I mentioned. Um, so um, that is uh, a wrap in terms of the content I wanted to cover. Um, if there's any questions of, of any kind, um, I guess we didn't get too many as we went through, but, but if anyone has any, um, I'm happy to answer them. If you wanna drop them into the chat, um, I'll stick around for a couple, couple of minutes. Um, otherwise, um, I hope everyone found this useful. We have on screen uh, the ability for you to, to book in a chat with one of our team. I think we've dropped that in the chat too. We're gonna to be doing these uh, webinars monthly. Um, uh, but sorry, not, maybe not monthly, but every two months. And eventually we're gonna scale them up to monthly, uh, I think in, in, in about six months time. So if you've enjoyed them, would love to hear any feedback. If there's topics you'd like us to cover, please do share and we will. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for attending and look forward to seeing you at the next one. Uh, we'll see you later. Thanks.